Amid the hype of the B-2 Spirit, otherwise known as the Stealth Bomber, a quite different strategic bomber emerged from the United States in the late 1980s. Nicknamed the Bone, it stands in contrast to the B-2 in almost every way, except for its name, which is close. While it lacks the stealth technology, it more than makes up for it with its thunderous supersonic speed and handling characteristics that make it more like a fighter than a traditional bomber. It is often referred to as the workhorse of the US bomber fleet. Today, the B-1 Lancer. Over 30 years have passed since the B-1 was introduced to the US Air Force. This is by no means a new kit on the block, but it has played a backseat role to the more illustrious aircrafts in the US fleet. But that should take absolutely nothing away from the B-1. It is an astonishing aircraft capable of carrying an absurdly large amount of weaponry at a top speed of Mach 1.25. But it also faced a long, troubled road to its introduction in 1986. Cancelled not once, but twice, the B-1 Lancer Pro program sometimes seems like it was dead in the water. If there's one thing that's absolutely clear though about the B-1, it is a belligerent survivor. As US technology developed through the 1950s, their focus settled on high-altitude bombers. This was seen as the only way to evade Soviet MiG fighters below, and for a while it worked, with the Lockheed U-2 cruising imperiously over Soviet airspace. But by the end of the decade, things were beginning to change. Improvements in Soviet surface-to-air missiles meant that the US's untroubled flight paths were now very much in range of those missiles. A stark example of this came in 1960, with the downing of a U-2 over the Soviet Soviet Union and the subsequent parading of its pilot, Gary Powers, to the world media. A new approach was definitely required, and the US knew that they needed to go from very high to very low. The B-70 Valkyrie, which had been in development since the mid-1950s, was eventually scrapped because it no longer fit the bill. And while the B-52 was rugged and dependable, its strength certainly didn't lie with low, fast flying. A new aircraft would be needed, an aircraft that could combine the enormous payload capacity of the B-52 and the supersonic speed of the Convair B-58. A flurry of studies followed throughout the 1960s as developers searched for the right blend of speed and power. To compound things further, there was the question of whether the US Air Force actually needed nuclear strike capabilities in the era of intercontinental ballistic missiles or ICBMs. The Air Force believed that it absolutely did, but the Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara disagreed and the project, which was at that point known as Advanced Manned Strategic Aircraft AMSA, was cancelled. When Richard Nixon was elected to office in 1969, AMSA, which had jokingly become America's most studied aircraft, was immediately re-established, and the Air Force issued a request for proposals in November of that same year. In January 1970, proposals were received by North American Rockwell, Boeing, and General Dynamic, with the Rockwell design edging out the others. Initially, this was just for a prototype aircraft, but the broad plan was to eventually have over 200 B-1s in operation by the end of the day decade, which was pretty much wildly optimistic, as we'll get into shortly. On December 23, 1963, the first prototype B-1A took to the skies, with three more quickly emerging. The costs were already spiraling upwards and would soon become a major point of contention. No surprises there. In 1970, the estimated cost of each aircraft was $40 million, $267 million today, but just five years later, that had risen to $70 million, which is up $468 million today. As often seems to be the case with politics, the B-1 became a hugely partisan issue. Republicans were all for it, while the Democrats stood opposed to it. During this campaigning for the 1976 US election, Jimmy Carter went as far as to say, the B-1 bomber is an example of a proposed system which should not be funded and would be wasteful of taxpayers' dollars. And those working on the B-1 must have cringed on election night when Jimmy Carter became the 39th President of the United States and, well, the entire program was quickly put on review. That's worth pointing out at this point that this was exactly the period when stealth technology was emerging, albeit quietly and very, very secretly. The enticing prospect of an invisible aircraft waiting in the wings no doubt weighed against the B-1 with its rapidly expanding cost. By 1977, the 20-year cost of a single B-1 had risen even further 
further to $100 million, which is $669 million today, and the introduction of the new AGM-86 air-launched cruise missile, which could be fired from a B-52 and had a huge 2,400km range, led many to once again question, why are we building this B-1 again? In June 1977, President Carter announced that the B-1 would be cancelled for a second time, with the U.S. instead focusing on ICBMs and improved B-52s carrying the AGM-86. The announcement did not come with any information about the impending stealth technology, because it was secret, but it no doubt played a part in the decision. Despite the cancellation of the project, test flights continued with prototypes for the next four years and involved 70 flights, totaling 378 hours. A top speed of Mach 2.22 was reached during testing, a speed that even the next generation B-1s would never reach. The election of Ronald Reagan in 1980 saw the fate of this troubled aircraft tilt once again in its favor, but in truth, Soviet actions around the world also played a decisive factor. The involvement of the USSR in Afghanistan, Cuba, and even Angola showed the US that their long-held fear of the spread of communism was taking effect. Up until that point, the US strategy had been one of containment, rather than the need to back up other countries should they be invaded. Suddenly, the US needed to face up to some rather glaring limitations and with the B-2 spirit still some way off in the distance, perhaps they really did need a low-altitude supersonic bomber after all. In January 1982, the US government placed an order for 100 B-1s at a combined cost of $2.2 billion, $5.9 billion today, but it came with several changes. Essentially, they'd created the B-1B. Overall speed was lowered, although low-level flying speed increased slightly from Mach 0.85 to 0.92. The maximum takeoff weight was also increased to allow for external weapons to be carried. The first, new and improved B-1 took flight on the 18th of October 1984, and two years later, they officially entered service. They were spectacularly late for the party, but they had finally arrived, since up until 1988, 100 B-1Bs rolled off the production line. It had taken over 25 years of studies, developments, and the inevitable political merry-go-rounds, but finally, the US Air Force had their low-altitude strategic bomber. The aircraft comes with a swept-wing design, meaning its wings point backwards rather than straight across. And these wings are also adjustable and can be shifted from 15 degrees to 67.5 degrees. The forward wing configuration is used for takeoff landings and high-altitude maximum cruise speed, while during high subsonic and supersonic flight, the wings are generally set in the aft configuration with the wings closer to the tail. It is 45 meters in length and has a wingspan of 42 meters when fully extended, but this comes down to 24 meters when they are in the swept back position. The B-1 is powered by four General Electric F-101 GE-102 afterburning turbofan engines, each producing 17,390 pound-force thrust each dry without afterburner and 30,780 with afterburner on, which is the additional combustion component used on some jets. It comes with a crew of four, an aircraft commander, pilot, offensive systems officer, and and defensive systems officer. The main computer on board the B-1 is the IBM AP-101, which is also used on the Space Shuttle Orbiter. One of the most exciting components included on the B-1 is the Terrain Following System, which essentially scans the area ahead of the aircraft and provides pitch input to help the pilot hug the terrain as closely as possible. Sometimes they fly as low as 60 meters, 200 feet above the ground. Its combat range is a mammoth 5,543 kilometers, which is roughly the distance from Denver, Colorado to Hawaii and can be refueled mid-air for those ultra-long distance missions. Considering it was primarily designed as a low-level bomber, it does have an impressive service ceiling of 60,000 feet, 18,000 meters. Now, as I mentioned right at the start of this video, the aircraft can carry a hefty amount of ordnance, the equivalent of two school buses. The B-1 comes with eight external hardpoints for ordnance. A hardpoint is essentially where you attach a missile and a capacity of 23,000 kilograms. Inside the aircraft, things get even bigger, and the B-1 one's three internal bomb bays can accommodate 34,000 kilograms of ordnance. The combined weight of all of this is roughly the same as 10 elephants, and do remember, it's doing all of this while being capable of breaking the sound barrier.
Despite its emergence in 1984 and full introduction two years later, it took another 18 years for the B-1 to see its first combat operation. When it finally appeared, the USSR was teetering on the brink, and the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 heralded in a very different world than what many, including the designers of the B-1, had anticipated. The first Iraq war began in 1990, but the B-1 was not used because it had been specifically designed as a nuclear bomber, and they weren't looking to completely obliterate the Middle Eastern country. Even if they had been available, it's unlikely that they would have taken part after an accident involving a B-1 in December 1990, which led to a 50-day grounding of the fleet while the accident was investigated. The Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, START, signed in 1995, meant that such aircraft were now obsolete, and this led to a massive redesign of the B-1 to make it start compliant. The bomb bay was divided in two, and the software included on the aircraft was changed to accommodate conventional weaponry. The first B-1 mission occurred in December 1998 during Operation Desert Fox, the little-remembered four-day bombing extravaganza which took place against Iraq in response to the country's apparent refusal to allow weapons inspectors into the country. They were back there again during the invasion of Iraq in 2003, and also played a part in Operation Enduring Freedom as the U.S. smashed their way into Afghanistan in search of Osama bin Laden. Laden. It continued to be a presence in both countries for several years and also took part in bombing raids in Libya in 2001 and Syria in 2014. During the bloody Battle of Kobane in Syria, B-1s dropped 660 bombs over five months in support of Kurdish forces, killing estimated 1,000 ISIS fighters, though how they can be so sure of those numbers, we don't exactly know. But either way, the B-1s dropped an awful lot of bombs during that time period. Just as with the B-2 spirit, the B-1's immediate role is under threat as a young pretender waits in the wings. The B-21 Raider, or Stealth Bomber Mark II as it seems to be, looks set to arrive on the scene in 2025 and will likely usher the B-1 fleet to the sidelines. The US Air Force has already set a tentative date of 2036 for the aircraft's retirement, but that is certainly not set in stone. The costs surrounding the B-1 are extraordinary, and they go much further than just manufacturing. Each flight hour requires roughly 48.4 hours of repair. A 12-hour mission costs an unbelievable $720,000 as of 2010, it's about $858,000 today, in fuel, repairs, and other various needs. These are big numbers, but still considerably less than what it costs to fly the B-2. From the very get-go, this has been an unloved and, compared to the B-2 spirit, perhaps even undervalued aircraft. Like so much military hardware that appeared during the 70s and 80s, many of which we've covered here on Mega Project, its design and purpose simply didn't match the world that it arrived in. Instead of low-level missions deep inside Soviet territory bristling with nuclear warheads, the B-1 found itself hampered because of its nuclear design, then flying missions predominantly over the Middle East, often hitting targets that had already been softened up first. In today's day and age, it's doubtful whether an aircraft with such capacity and speed is even really needed. It may seem like the B-1 Lancer plays second fiddle to the iconic B-2, but it is still a record breaker and holds 61 different world records for speed, payload, distance, and time to climb in different aircraft weight classes. It may have flaws, but it remains unmatched in many aspects. This unloved, delayed, and often sidelined monster deserves some recognition. The dazzling, sexy aircraft might get the attention, but it is the brutish workhorses that really get the job done. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, smash that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, suggestions for future mega projects. Please use the comments below. I do look at those for suggestions. And as you'll see, a lot of the videos that we make are from people commenting. So please do leave a comment below. And thank you for watching.